Good morrow, fellow humans. My name is Sean Crowley, and I am obsessed with infinity. So join me as I attempt to unpick the infinities of what is. What is the structure of time? Beyond our perspective, time may have many potential structures, or no structure at all. Some have said that the past, present and future are all equally valid in reality. Some just the past and present. And others say that the present is the only real truth. So let us begin with these. Firstly, we have eternalism, which for all intents and purposes is the same as the block universe theory discussed across the last few chapters. Eternalism, closely associated with a theory of time called perdurantism, claims that time is omnipresent. In this model, the past, present and future all merge under one timeless totality. And... It is through this four-dimensional slab of unmoving time and space that our frame of consciousness and the physical dynamics of entropy find their uniquely linear paths. In this model, consciousness may be linear, but our fundamental physicality is like the worm in the apple. Exturantism is again similar, though Instead of imagining the identity of objects and events as passing through the timeless block universe, this theory sees the flow of time as being broken into a series of frames or stages, akin to frames of film, static, interconnected, non-temporal moments. Then there is the so-called growing block universe theory, which again claims the existence of an objectively real past, but does away with the objectively real future. In this case, the present acts like a temporal wavefront of the past. In this model, there is no such thing as a future for a present to eternally crash into, only an evolving present, forever shedding layers into a growing past, just as a coral sea grows upon the bones of bygone reefs. And finally, we have presentism, the claim that there is only this one moment. Here, the past and future are no more than constructs of human creativity. In contrast to the four-dimensional perdurantism, the identity of objects and events become constricted to a three-dimensional endurantism where objects may be spread out through space via their extended parts but not spread out in time. Now is all there is. It's hard to know which of these conceptual frames are worth subscribing to, as each has its benefits and pitfalls. Instinctively, we may feel like presentism is the most sensible option, since we know that the past was once the present, and that those structures and events that once made up that present are no longer in the same order that present became this present. Likewise, the future may be considered predictable through some element of universal determinism, but this doesn't force us to believe that the future has to literally exist before it too becomes the present. Though all this leaves us with is the present. So we must therefore ask, what is the structure of this present? We may initially think of it as being an instant, a mere moment, perhaps durationless to an infinite degree. But if this is the case, how does change occur? Since change requires duration. If the present is an infinitely short durationless moment, like a living frame, let's say, how does one instant become another? we are thus forced to offer our description of the present some extended temporal dimension, 
some direction through which it can evolve and become. And atop this initial noodle scratcher, do we also have to consider Einstein's relativistic view of time, which only ever allows us to appreciate a present moment from within a small window of causality. In other words, an individual's shared present is limited in size by the speed of light. Anything that falls outside of this cone of causality cannot be said to share any relative nowness at all. What this means is that if the speed of light is exactly 299,792,458 metres per second, and it is, then at the resolution of one second increments, now is everything within a 299,792,458 metre radius of the person asking, what time is it? Within smaller increments of time, however, that radius shrinks. For example, our unconscious reaction time is approximately 300 milliseconds. So within the time it takes for our awareness to become reactive, light will have travelled only 89,801 kilometres, or 55,800 miles. Which means that from our personal perspective, now has a radius that stretches three quarters of the way to the moon. Whilst at the resolution of a mere nanosecond, now can only be considered within less than an arm's length. Thus the present, if even there is such a thing, appears to be a solely localised event. Add to that the varied speeds of time where a split second on Earth may be the relative equivalent to centuries passed on some distant planet. And we start to see why, beyond the cone of causality, asking what time it is, is next to meaningless. So, if the present is local, but time is universal, it follows that a presentist view must be missing some piece of the puzzle some angle that's not being fully appreciated. It may be very accurate to state that there is only this one moment. I, for one, get very passionate about the type of thinking that this sentiment conjures. But it is still a metaphorical description. There is a certain element of poetry to this sentiment that assumes a private acknowledgement of the vastness of what a moment is. So again, we must be cautious with our metaphors. Because just like it was, with the extra conceptual dimension that I proposed as necessary for understanding infinite mathematical sets or big bangs, there is yet another hidden dimension here that needs to be verbalised. This being the one that separates Newtonian from Einsteinian space-time. Because even though Einsteinian space-time warps in some dimension that Newton's doesn't, both are still described as being four-dimensional structures, being the three spatial and one temporal. So what then is Einstein's extra dimension of time? Essentially, if you're made of ordinary matter, it's the axis between gravity, or space-time curvature, and momentum though nowhere within the three spatial or one temporal dimensional axis is this offered. So if we can move through time and space at angles that were not previously allowed in Newton's world, is it perhaps more accurate to say that Einstein's world is a five-dimensional one? Whether yes or no, the problem still stands. We must name the invisible if it is to become seen. And these aren't easy things to see. But this is why, in the attempt to fill in these blanks, many turn back to the eternalist point of view, imagining a block universe that not only contains time, but persists beyond it. All well and good, but just like a poorly repaired, rickety old boat, one plug here might cause another leak there. The reason eternalist theories of time can feel so unsettling is not simply due to their underlying unintuitiveness. 
It's also to do with an issue of fate and predetermined destiny. Because with a block universe comes the destruction of free will. Given this, it may appear surprising how popular this metaphysical framework is among physicists. But the reason for such popularity is that it ties in nicely with the apparent rationality of superdeterminism. A superdeterministic worldview claims that the laws governing reality are infinitely causal. Things don't just happen as a result of chaotic chance, because if they did, all science would ultimately be meaningless. Things happen as a result of determinable causes and effects. One cause in, one effect out. But suppose we choose to take on this belief that the universe is governed by such strict universal laws as Einstein did. In that case, we must also confront the realization that we too are governed by these same laws, meaning that every thought, action and moment of our lives that ever has or ever will be was predetermined from the moment that the universe sprang into existence. A fact that, unfortunately, also destroys the viability of science as a truth-seeking practice, given that we were always going to discover what we discovered and never a cent more, no matter how hard we try. But as the self-made entities we are, we're not too fond of being told that we have no control over our choices. For starters, it would wreak havoc on our legal institutions. And more importantly, we just don't like it. Some alternate theories, such as the growing block universe, have attempted to counter this determinism by leaning into the more probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics, envisioning a reality where chaos is an inbuilt component of nature, thus allowing the future to be open-ended. For as the secrets of the very small have continued to unfold over the last century, the discoveries made have been of a world far less definitive picture of reality where the atoms that make up the universe can never be pinned down to either a location or a speed at the same time. A world where free will might be shaped not by deterministic causes and effects, but by non-ultimate probabilities, describing a future that bubbles up ahead of us like a cloud of yeses, noes and maybes, where our experienced 4D reality only takes shape as the present unfolds. So let us play for a while, upon this our next shoreline of knowledge, and try to visualise what this inquiry is hinting at via a little thought experiment concerning my wife's late granduncle, veteran Jim Lowe, and his own tale of decisive action. It was two days after Christmas 1944 and I was in command of a searchlight unit in central Belgium as part of the Brussels defence layout. The weather at the time was atrocious, with persistent heavy snow on the ground, making it difficult for searchlight crews to maintain the required state of readiness that was needed at all times. The purpose in hand for me and my five-man crew was to maintain a constant searchlight beacon in the sky during the hours of darkness in conjunction with similar sights all the way from the Channel Coast deep into Germany, forming a dual carriageway for the Allied planes in and out of their bombing missions. The German High Command had just mounted their final offensive of the war in a last desperate attempt to halt the Allied advance into their country. By this stage of the war, there were few active enemy planes flying, but there was the odd rogue fighter to be aware of. And so it was that around 22.15 p.m. in the evening of the 27th of December, the searchlight site was attacked by a low-flying aircraft with cannon fire which put out of action one searchlight projector and one generator and shattered both power cables servicing the searchlights, thereby completely disabling the complex. The two soldiers operating the equipment at the time were wounded and the operations tent was riddled with cannon shells and splinters. It was vital that the site be restored to full operation 
as quickly as possible. History is fraught with such stories, both successful and not so. But for us, this story might turn out to be more than a mere tale of soldiers following orders, since, as Jim himself recalled, that particular episode was dense with many complex and variable facets. The surprise element of the attack and the danger of induced panic. The transformation from bright searchlight exposure to complete and utter darkness. The urgent need to attend to the wounded colleagues. The overriding pressure to get the site up and running again. The need through positive leadership to reassure the local populace that the military were in control of the situation. The minute to minute minutia requiring attention. And although the two wounded men had to be removed for medical attention, reducing the complement from six men to four, a reorganized site schedule was implemented to full operational standard in record time. Jim was only 22 at the time, the youngest in his unit by several years. But as his field commander later recalled, Jim's response to the emergency displayed, quote, an enthusiasm and initiative in excess of that which can be normally expected from a junior non-commissioned officer, end quote. And it was for this that Jim was awarded the Belgian Cru de Guerre with Palm. But were there hidden factors that led to Jim's response? At what point can it be said that Jim's intent of free will took over? allowing this heroic character to shine through, capable of feats above and beyond. In those split-second moments of noise, fear and confusion, Jim was seen to make a series of self-directed decisions and act upon them. And though he firmly believed that his service accolade was not just the honour of one man, but of an entire crew, these were nonetheless choices of his own making. A fact that he could never rightly be robbed of. However, beneath the very human story is another, which for our purposes must be considered. This is the story revealed within the biological makeup of his brain and body, where a complex of predetermined factors influenced all that we attribute to Jim and his heroic efforts. Factors such as his personality type, determined by a culmination of life experiences and his genetic makeup. His state of mind, determined by the chemical reactions of stress hormones, blood sugar, adrenaline and more, each a reaction to the cause of past events. Be that the amount or quality of food he had eaten, the amount or quality of sleep, the level of stress the mind was under, and so on, into infinity. Everything involved in making those decisions was based on a series of past events that not only set up Jim's person, but also led to the fact that he was in this location and situation in the first place. So that at this very instant in time, all variables were set and decided as a result of a chain of events stretching back well before his birth. Events traceable to the beginning of the universe itself. As so clearly intuited by the 17th century philosopher Barak Spinoza, quote, In the mind, there is no absolute free will, but the mind is determined to wish this or that by a cause, which has also been determined by another cause, and this last by another cause, and so on into infinity. End quote. Thus, this chain of events is one and the same as the chain of events that have been shifting energies within the infinite, infinitely. But with all this said, these were still his decisions. No puppet master could ever be held responsible for his actions. So which is it? Do we have tangible control over our choices or not? As I see it, the question has now shifted from what is a decision to what is a decision maker? 
Are we the sum of our parts and thus a silent passenger in the universe? Or are we independent and whole, individual, with minds capable of shaping our world? This is where theorists have begun to look towards the uncertainties of quantum mechanics in the hope that we might rectify this conflict with a gut feeling, though it's hardly made things any easier. Theorists, troubled by the conflict, have begun seriously considering the validity of multiverse theories, such as Many Worlds, offered by physicist Hugh Everett in 1957. The way Everett's broader perspective might hope to resolve the issue is through the emergence of an infinite count of parallel universes, where every possible effect to any initial cause happens in some parallel dimension. In the case of our soldier's tale, in some other parallel universe, he instead found himself overwhelmed by the noise and destruction and crumbled into a scatter of nerves, hindering the much-needed repairs, resulting in yet another reign of even more devastating attacks. Though in a world of infinite probabilities, scenarios are rarely split 50-50, since if we head just a few universes over, our soldier, riding upon an entirely different wave of events, was instead born in another country, leading to an alternate history where Jim was the rogue fighter who, on that cold Christmas evening, gunned down the searchlights. The argument as to whether this wave of potentiality allows for an infinite or finite series of universes is still argued among the multiverse theorists. But even if finite, it could still unfold along such unpredictable lines that this same rabbit hole could end upon a scene where our soldier is a pink, furry, self-aware rock moss that spends its entire life manipulating translucent echoes of beings from alternate dimensions through the power of song, whilst these same echoes run about his mossy pink rock bed in the belief that they are, in fact, in control of their own decisions. Dodging paradoxes. A new kind of fun. But is this still Jim? And if not, is an identical Jim that chose red over blue, left over right, or any other insignificant choice, our Jim? Now granted, this may be an intentional attempt to push the many worlds argument into the realms of reductio ad absurdum, but to be fair to Everett, the existence of our day-to-day -day reality is just as much of an impossibly ludicrous outcome for the universe to take as is any story of Soldier Pink Moss. Since, in an infinite universe with infinite probabilities, the possibility of any scenario occurring might just be infinitely probable. In other words, wacky stuff like this could be happening all the time. What the multiverse theory does offer us, however, is a theory that, though still counterintuitive, allows for a tangible hold over our destiny. Sure, another version of you may take that different path, but our linear, time-bound consciousness still holds at least some independence within the universe. I mean, I would hope so. After all, this is nothing short of our ego at stake here. Though, if history is anything to go by, ego might not be the best guiding star, considering that our ego has been taking hits of this nature for thousands of years. First was the uncomfortable discovery that, in counter to the endless proclamations of our so-called wise men, the Earth was not at the centre of the universe. There we were, one of many drifting around our magnanimous star, but then did we go on to discover that not even this golden heavenly sphere held any position of priority within the cosmos? Not our solar system, our galaxy, and now not even our universe, and possibly not even ourselves. Because why should our perspective of self be anything different? 
Why should we have freedom through a force of will, whereas other living entities, such as plants, don't? This is where Western philosophy seems to have tied one hand behind its back, as Western philosophy is centred on the concept of facts, what's referred to as the principle of bivalence, where one truth will always be present and any contradiction to that fact must either disprove the initial fact or be proven false itself due to its contradiction with the proven fact. Eastern philosophy has historically been somewhat more tolerant towards contradiction. Two things can contradict one another whilst still being equally true. A picture that seems to resonate with what's happening here. Because due to our own experience, we each know firsthand that Jim was aware of his existence. His reality and observations are indeed valid. He alone experienced thought and emotion and made decisions based on these. And more importantly, he also experienced all the repercussions, good and bad. All this happens, unfolding along a private perspective of linear time. But neither Jim nor ourselves are simple, independent travellers of the universe, because equally, we are the universe. Our story, physical makeup, choices, and linear experience of time all exist. It's just that their independence can only be appreciated from within a space time locked perspective. A perspective somewhat like looking out of a window. What one sees from the window is real, even though the perspective from outside of the house encompasses so much more. The point is that this additional truth beyond our frame, never has to detract from the truth behind the window's limited perspective. Another simile would be the shape of the woodcutter's wedge. From its profile, it appears triangular, from above rectangular, and from behind it appears circular. But though each perspective may seem at first contradictory, it's evident that When we appreciate things from broader perspectives, we understand each frame in relation to the other. The problem we encounter with the concept of free will is that it suggests freedom, an idea that considers consciousness independent from all external influence. But of course it's not. As consciousness is not only tied to its influences, it is emergent through them a trail of cause and effect that is never-ending, and as such, there will never be any outside influence that could impose itself upon the individual since the individual and environment are at one, evolving together through time. Just as the individual is influenced by the evolution of the environment, so is the environment influenced by the evolution of the individual. But where does all this leave our understanding of time? What now seems to be apparent is that regardless of whether or not we live in a reality determined by a non-changing block of time, free will shall only ever be appreciated as a localised perspective, much the same as Einstein's relativistic now. Because even if free will is a trait of the universe that is ultimately real. It cannot be considered any more or less independent from the cosmos than is either space or time. Thus, we cannot rely on the validity of free will as an informant on the nature of time. However, it highlights that we will be hard-pressed to escape the bafflement as long as the dichotomy between conscious and non-conscious time remains tangled. And really, that's the big one, isn't it? To know what separates our experience from the time that persists purely for itself. After 800 million years of evolution, it seems inconceivable 
to think that we might one day learn which of nature's cycles were responsible for shaping the temporality of our consciousness, because all we see is a dense tapestry, a harmony of systems collectively tied to the chance rhythms of celestial tides and molecular clockwork. From the circadian rhythms of beating hearts, pumping lungs and neuronal oscillators, down to the cycles hidden within our atoms, a shared tempo of life, unitedly governing our every aspect of being. And so it can be more than a little tricky to know where to start. One factor that does appear pertinent is the mental record of time's passing, a play of reflection and memory that demands the past gone and the present both here and now. This influence, above any other, is what really convinces us of time's actuality. Though witless perceptions are easily exposed, as our experience of time is far from clockwork. In the hands of an experiencer, time changes from one beat to the next. At once, time is like punk rock, impulsive, frantic, over before it's begun, and in the next, reflective and brooding, like a slow opening prog rock juggernaut that melts minutes into eternities. When we're asleep, time interjects little more than a performance of John Cage's 433, but never is time for the experiencer, like the rigid tick of a metronome. Time might dance, but it doesn't tick, as Lewis Carroll's Mad Hatter put it. I dare say you've never even spoke to time. Perhaps not, Alice cautiously replied. But I know I have to beat time when I learn music. Ah! That accounts for it, said the Hatter. He won't stand beating. What all of this clarifies is that just as we fail to host any ultimate experience of sight, hearing or touch, so must we host an imperfect experience of time. For a time that is synonymous with experience shall always presume a neurological influence. But behind this reductive materialism lies the more profound hidden question. Has the brain evolved to sense time, or has the brain evolved to interpret a reality that is simply other, generating the time we experience as a byproduct? And curiously, this then brings us back to our earlier idea of a universe without consciousness. For if there is no experiencer, capable of determining a now from then, can we still say that time passes? Beyond consciousness, does the arrow of time always follow its linear path? Is there a universal present that persists beyond that which is relevant to the individual? There is a lot in this thought, and it may take some unpacking. Though the way I would like to do this is by first determining what the self is. This alone will take up much of our journey together. But then, and only then, shall we be capable of considering the temporality of consciousness, which will hopefully give us reason to dare a retake on the question of time itself. Thank you so much for listening to the episode. Um, I just wanted to offer a massive round of thanks uh, and let you know that the YouTube page is currently up and running and that's giving weekly visualizations to the same readings that's happening in the podcast. So if you want to go over there and check that out, that is, again, Infinite Now with Sean Crowley. So 
hopefully I'll see you there week by week. Apart from that, much love, and uh, I hope you have a lovely day. See ya.